Hello, I'm Graham, and I hope everyone's having a great day. And welcome to part two in this video tutorial series. I'm running for new users to the Panasonic Lumix FZ80 or 82 bridge camera. Now, in part one, we looked at the IA mode and how capable that was of getting some great results. In part two, we're going to look at using the program auto mode and some of the reasons why you should choose program auto over the fully intelligent auto mode. So. First of all, I'd like to recap on some of the issues that uh, arose from yesterday's video, mainly around the selection of autofocus. So I'm going to set the camera up so again I can record the screen and walk you through some of those setups before we start talking about the program auto mode. I've got the camera now set up so I can record the screen of the FZ82. Uh, you notice I'm in the IA plus mode. Uh, the camera's not identified this as a landscape shot, which is uh, surprising, but that is one of the issues with Intelligent Auto. It relies on the camera determining the type of brightness of the scene, uh, the colors of the scene, the distribution of tones in the scene as to what it re uh, recognizes as its uh, subject. So here it's just said it's a standard uh, scene. There's no bias towards landscape or portrait or food, that sort of thing but that's okay but what you will notice is when I press the shutter button halfway down you'll get a series of rectangles which the camera believes are the focus points that I want to be taking now that might be right or it might be wrong and that is one of the issues with the intelligent auto mode that sometimes you'll get out of focus pictures because the camera's determined a focus point which may be closer to the camera than you would particularly want and it's set focus on that now the way around that is either to use the autofocus tracking mode or the, mo the method that I used in the first video which is the single point. So for example if I wanted that uh, archway to be the focus point for this video I can touch that with the, uh, my finger or with a stylus and you may notice on the screen now there is a little um, box with uh, cursor marks through it. If I gently move the camera side to side you'll notice that even if I'm moving the camera round and round, the camera attempts to keep focus on that door. So it means that the camera will stay locked in focus. To cancel that, you just need to touch the AF mark on the screen here and that will turn that particular point off. Now the method I prefer is to use the single point autofocus, but it's a workaround and you can't normally achieve that in the IA mode. The way I do this is to use the control which allows us to change the uh, aperture. So if you press in the top control dial, first of all you'll get to expose your compensation, which you don't want, then press it in again and that will bring up the scale which tells you the aperture and shutter speed. Now. You just need to move it away from wherever it is. So if I, it's on its default of uh, about F4, I'm just going to move slightly to the right, which will just move it off the bottom stop, and then press the button again, and that brings us back to the shooting screen, and you'll now notice we've got a rectangular square in the middle of the screen. Now, if I use the cursor control left here, it means I can position that to where I want the camera to focus. So if that doorway is the focus point that I need. I can leave it set there and then I can take that picture and that point will be in focus. If I wanted this tree here to be the focus point then obviously I can move that over to this tree and that will become the focus point. Again if I wanted the building to be in focus just change the focus point over there so it's as simple as that now to cancel that you just need to move out of the IA mode and go to say the P mode and go back and it will go back into its regular pattern identifying focusing mode the 49 area method so to get into that again just press the button twice on the top of the camera, move it one click to the right, which then selects a, a reasonably uh, small aperture, press it once again and you'll come back to the focus square. You can position that to where you need it and then you can take your shot. To cancel it, just move off the IA mode and back to the IA mode and you'll be ready to shoot again. So in today's video we're going to start looking at the program auto mode. Now program auto mode is exactly the same as the intelligent auto mode except that it doesn't use the scene type determination to set the parameters for the picture. So there's no chance that you'll get a food type uh, scene if you're taking a portrait or anything like that. So the P mode doesn't use scene type determination. 
To enter P mode, just turn the top control dial until P is opposite the white index mark and you'll get verification by the fact you've got P on your screen. Now, when we go into a program auto mode, it opens up the camera for a lot more current controls. Notice we only had uh, a few options available when we were in the IA plus mode, but now we're in the P mode. If we go into the menu, we've got a lot more options that have come to life. A lot of these options were greyed out, but now we're getting options to, to set them. Again, you can use the zoom key to move quickly through those menus if you wanted to get to a particular page. Now, remember in the intelligent auto mode, the photo style, we just had a choice of uh, the standard or monochrome. But here now in the program auto mode, we've got a choice of standard, vivid, natural, monochrome, scenery, portrait and one which you can customize yourself but also notice that within those photo styles we've now got control of how that camera deals with that scene so if we wanted to increase the contrast on a dull day we can increase the contrast if you wanted to increase the sharpening so we can use the outer camera jpeg we can just increase the sharpness slightly and to compensate we might want to knock the noise reduction down so that it doesn't smear the finer details and again if you wanted to increase the uh, saturation we can increase the saturation if you press menu set those will be locked into that photo style when you come back to the shooting menu you notice we've got standard now and there's a little plus by the side of it to remind you that you've got some additional control set on that particular photo style Remember in the intelligent auto mode, the ISO was automatic. Now in the program auto mode, the ISO is under your control. So to gain access to the ISO, it's the top position on the cursor button. Press that and you notice now we can change the ISO to whatever we need. In intelligent auto mode, it's always in the ISO position. But now we've got manual control, so we can actually lock it down at ISO 80, so it always stays on the best ISO for this camera. Or we can change that to a higher value if we need to select, say, a faster shutter speed for the shots we're taking. In this instance, because I'm on a tripod and I want the very best image quality out of this camera, I'm going to set that to ISO 80. The other thing you had no control of, or very little control, was white balance. Now, white balance is set by using the right-hand side of the four-way navigation dial. So by pressing white balance, you notice it comes up to auto white balance, which is what the intelligent auto mode uses, but it now gives us an option to change that to one of the presets. So you've got sunny, which would be a bright sunny day, cloudy, if you're photographing in shade, tungsten light, flash, and now you've got four customizable white balance settings that you can use if you're using it in the studio or you've got a particular lighting setup you can record that lighting setup and save it as a custom preset so you don't have to keep going through the white balance set procedure now i will be doing a manual white balance uh, later in this series so to recap to set a white balance preset press the white balance control and then select the one that's most appropriate for the day so i'm going to select cloudy today which will give me a, a slightly warmer look than what we've currently got which will go nicer with this stonework so i'm going to select the cloudy preset so we've now set our ISO to the lowest value, which is 80. We've got a cloudy preset. We've set our photo style to give us extra sharpening and slightly less noise reduction. And now we can take the picture, but I'm going to set the drive mode so we can take this with a two second timer. So two seconds, let the camera decide on what aperture and shutter speed it should take because that's a function of the program auto mode. And it will take that picture for us. Now we notice we've got a few blinkies there, which is the bright white sky, but it's a very overcast, very grey day, so that sky is likely to show highlight warnings. Uh, there's no real detail in the sky. If I was to try and change that by using the exposure value compensation, and again we access that through the top control dial, if I um, change this to minus, say, two-thirds, um, let's take that picture, you notice there's very little change to the sky detail. So in this particular case, I'm gonna leave the exposure value compensation set to zero. If you've got it uh, set 
uh, minus, then you are running the risk of having to push the uh, image in your processing and lift the shadows, and you might get more noise. So the brighter you can get the picture, the better it is for the final result. So I'll just take that picture again, just to confirm with it. So we're taking this at aperture f4.3 with a shutter speed of uh, 1 50th of a second. But if I wanted more depth of field, and to get more depth of field then I need to use a smaller aperture, I need to make the camera change that combination of shutter and aperture to give me the one that I want. So while it's highlighted in yellow, if I use this top control dial and move it to the right, and then move it to the left, you notice that I've got a P come up with a double edit arrow. And it means now we're in what's called program shift. So while I'm changing the value of the aperture, you notice the camera is also changing the shutter speed to make that corresponding change to keep the exposure right. So 4.3 is where it starts. I want to go to f5.6, so I'm new now move the control to give me f5.6 and that will stay locked at 5.6 so you'll notice that once the shutter speed and aperture combination has gone away there is that double edit arrow to remind you that you're using program shift so i'm now going to take this picture which will be at f5.6 which will have slightly more depth of field There's also the issue with lens sharpness. Now this camera is particularly sharp at f4 and f5.6. It runs a little bit softer as you move towards f8 because of what's called diffraction. But don't worry about that, it just means if you've got a small aperture you will end up with slightly less sharp pictures. Now remember as you zoom in um, the aperture will change all the way up to f5.9. You now notice that as we, we zoom fully in that f5.6 that we set has now become f7.1 because it's this is not a constant aperture lens as this lens extends it loses brightness and that's reflected in the aperture setting if i was to go into the setting mode you notice that i can only go to f5.9 which is the lowest aperture when this lens is fully extended so I would recommend you try and keep to f5.9 if you're using the extended telephoto mode because that gives you the sharpest aperture. If you allow it to go up to uh, f8 you'll notice slightly softening in your image so try to keep that to f5.9. So now we can we can take that shot let's uh, t find a better subject. Now we'll take the picture and again we're using that two second timer to take the picture. Now also remember in the Intelligent Auto we had the option there to change to an electronic shutter and I'm going to do that because we're now at the extended telephoto mode, so 1200mm effective focal length. The camera will respond to the slightest change with any breeze blowing on it, if your tripod's not on a really firm surface. Any actuations in the camera such as the shutter will cause the camera to change its position and give you a blurred picture. So I'm going to use the electronic shutter which doesn't move any components in the camera apart from opening the shutter. So they should be nice sharp pictures. I'm now going to focus the camera on Rivington Pike, which is about a mile away from me, and then we can see uh, whether you get any bounce with a mechanical shutter versus the electronic shutter. So I've now set up the camera on Rivington Pike. You might just notice there are a, a couple there walking um, by the railings which surround the, the uh, tower on the hill. So this is using the 1200mm effective focal length and you can verify that with the zoom control there. The, the first shot I'm going to take using that two second timer with the electronic shutter. And then the next shot I'm going to use the mechanical shutter and let's see if there's any change in the sharpness of the picture.
With a bridge camera like this, there's probably not much um, movement because the shutter is actually in the lens. It's not like a DSLR where you've got a curtain moving at the back, which does uh, cause the camera to vibrate. So with an in-the-lens shutter like these have, you're probably not going to notice a lot more uh, difference. The, the benefit of the mechanical shutter is the extended times you can use the camera. So while you're in program auto mode and you've got program shift enabled so you've got the P with the double added arrow even if I move into the aperture priority mode or the IA mode when I go back to the P mode you notice that it's remembered the value that you've left set so if I press the shutter button again you notice it comes back to f7.1 now the way to cancel that is obviously to turn off the camera but if you go back into uh, the control once it's in the yellow indication of aperture and shutter speed move the control until that double arrow double headed arrow disappears so you're turning it uh, counterclockwise and now notice that the arrow has disappeared when we come back to shooting you notice there's no p and a double headed arrow so we're not using program shift now the other thing you've got control of when you're using the p mode is the autofocus area now by using the left hand navigation button here you can bring up the AF mode selection and you can use one area so you can use the custom motor and that allows you to select the points that you want um, and save them as a custom motor either vertical horizontal uh, you can define the pattern that you want for this motor mode you can see on screen now that is the area that the camera will use to take the picture but more importantly you've got the 49 area you've got focus tracking and face detect but the most important one for me is the single area remember we had single area in the IA mode if you use the uh, workaround that I showed you but in this method it will allow, allow you to change the size and the position of that focus area so if you wanted a pinpoint um, control then you can position this on your subject and then it would use that for the uh, focus point. So it allows you to change both the size and the position of that uh, focus area. So the position is changed by using the left right navigation button or by moving it on the screen using your finger and the size is controlled by using the top control dial. Well there we are, that's the program auto mode and you can see we can be a lot more creative with our photography because we've got more control over the camera features. In the next video we're going to be looking at the aperture priority mode and the shutter priority mode and how again those can add to your creativity when you're shooting with this particular camera. If you're a new viewer to this channel please do click that subscribe button and again click that bell notification icon and you'll get notification when I upload part 3 and the subsequent videos in this series. Also check out my photographic blog and I'll put a link to that in the video description below. On that blog there's a lot more information about this camera under the review section and a lot more information around Panasonic bridge cameras in general. There will also be the application on the home page to join my news group letter and that contains a lot more technical information, it's not just a newsletter. There will also be an ebook to follow this series and the details of that will be published in the newsletter. So if you're not enrolled for the newsletter, please sign up for the blog and uh, the newsletter itself. So until the next one, thanks again for watching, please do take care and I hope to see you all in the next one. Goodbye for now.